Well, good evening and welcome to Cornerstone Church this evening online. I'm so glad you've joined us. Uh, this evening we're continuing our series in the Psalms and we're getting to probably the most famous psalm of all, Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a wonderful psalm um, and I'm really looking forward to reading it and opening it up. So I'm so glad you've joined us. But before we come to the psalm, let's uh, pray and then let's sing together. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, our heavenly Father God, we thank you that you are our Father who loves us, yet you are heavenly. You are in control of all things. And our Lord God, as we come to you this weekend with a week of news of more lockdowns and of more spread of viruses, and perhaps news that we've had personally that others don't know about, Father, we thank you that you love us, that you gave your son for us, that you are here with us, but yet you are on your throne and in control. We pray this evening that as we open up your word, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us as the shepherd, that we this evening would be refreshed, that, Father, we would know what it is to be led by you. So be with us for your glory, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, our opening hymn this evening is taken from the Aberystwyth Conference and it's one of my favourite uh, Wesley hymns, Tis Finished, The Messiah Dies.
What a wonderful hymn that is. I, I hope you sang along uh, where you were. Well, we're going to turn to uh, the Bible now and we're going to read that most famous of Psalms, Psalm 23. And I'm going to read it from uh, the NIV. I'm sure it's one of those Psalms where there'll be bits where you go, no, but I say it this way. Um, but it's good just to remind ourselves of the text, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me ask you a question. Are you scared of the dark? Are you scared of the dark? I can remember as a little boy being scared of the dark. I would scream out for my parents and cry out an S-O-S, save our souls. And you know when children these days are scared of the dark, um, we actually buy them night lights, night lights, and we make sure that they have a little bit of a light so they feel safe throughout the night. But it's not just physical darkness that scares us, but actually there's also spiritual darkness. Uh, St. John of the Cross famously spoke of the dark night of the soul, the dark night of the soul. And perhaps you're here this evening watching this and you know the dark night of the soul. It could be due to ill health, it could be down to family strains, it could be because you're facing death. It could be financial worries because the furlough season is coming to an end. It could be work stress because you're having to work from home and manage the family. It could be the increasing lockdowns and facing another winter alone. It could be that you're doubting whether God loves you, whether he knows what you're going through, whether he cares for you. We can all at times go through the dark night of the soul. And the question is always... Where are you, God? Where are you, God? If you're asking that question, I've got good news for you. Psalm 23 is here to give you an answer. Psalm 23 is here to give you an answer. Really, Psalm 23 is the antidote to that dark night of the soul. It's not something that you take and takes away your pain straight away. But it is something you can meditate on and think upon as a, a kind of course of antibiotics that over time will help you. In a nutshell, what I want to say this evening is this. God is with us all the time in goodness. God is with us all the time in goodness. You see, this psalm, as Sinclair Ferguson puts it, speaks to every dark experience in life. There's no one experience kind of being described here, but an overarching experience that describes those dark struggles. And so because it's such a rich psalm that approaches us in the dark night of the soul, Spurgeon said that this is David's heavenly pastoral, the pearl of the psalms. So let's unpack this most beloved of psalms. And can I just be honest, I feel a real nervousness in preaching on this because you have probably heard a hundred sermons on this psalm you have probably prayed this psalm at the most difficult times or read it to loved ones at the most difficult times or even heard it preached in funerals of loved ones so I'm so aware that we have a deep relationship with this psalm my only hope is that I just I just don't mess it up this evening so three thoughts for number one God is with us. God is with us. We see that in verses one to three. Now the premise um, is that as uh, David puts it, that 
God is a shepherd. Now, David has every right to say that because David, even though he was a king, started out life as a shepherd boy. And so it's interesting that he describes God as a shepherd, particularly when you realise that back in those days, the shepherd was one of the lowliest and lowest jobs there was available. It wasn't a great job. You were out in all weathers. Think about David. He was the smallest, the runt of the family. And that's why he went to do the shepherding work. So when God reveals himself as a shepherd in the Bible, we need to feel that shock. We need to feel that. We need to understand that what he's doing here is accommodating himself. He's using an allegory, a picture, to help us to know how to understand him. And it is as a lowly shepherd. But actually, it's not just an allegory, is it? This whole idea of God accommodating himself, bringing himself down, is not just a metaphor or illustration. The New Testament tells us that God has done more than given us a metaphor. He has come into our world. We know this from Philippians chapter 2. He, you know, did not consider equality with God. Jesus didn't consider his sameness with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, became one of us, the incarnation. God came into this world and he, in Jesus, was the great shepherd. So Hebrews chapter 13 will say this about Jesus. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our dear Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, so when it starts off with the Lord is my shepherd, the shepherd is God and the shepherd is Jesus, the good shepherd who comes to lay down his life for the sheep. Then the question is, well, who are the sheep? Who can recite Psalm 23? Who can say it? Well, who are the sheep of the shepherd? It's quite easy. Uh, go up onto a mountain, go over towards Hereford somewhere, um, try and steal a sheep and see what happens. If you try and steal a sheep, you will soon find a farmer with a gun. And the reason the farmer will have a gun is because the sheep is his property. The sheep is the property of the shepherd. So who are the sheep when it comes to the Lord Jesus? It is the ones who are his property, the ones whom he has bought. So that's every Christian. If you are a Christian, you are a sheep to the shepherd, Jesus. This psalm applies to every Christian, everyone who has trusted in Christ, who has been united with Christ, who has been bought by Christ, is included in this psalm and therefore it's something of a confidence psalm have you ever thought about the confidence the lord is my shepherd the lord is my shepherd it's not i hope the lord is a shepherd or wouldn't it be nice if the lord was a shepherd or god is something like a shepherd no the lord is my shepherd and the brilliant thing is is that if the lord is my shepherd I lack nothing. I lack nothing. He is enough. He is the shepherd who has prepared the way, got all the food, got all the danger out of the way, and we are sheep who have nothing. We are never sheep who are malnourished. We are never sheep who are in desperate care of a vet. No, we are sheep who are cared for. And the shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, is here with me. This is not a distant shepherd who is guiding the sheep via CCTV. No, this is a shepherd who is close. Our God is not distant, but close and personal and intimate. And look at how he cares for us. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Green pastures, quiet waters... They're pictures of refreshment, rest and restoration. Green pastures sitting down in luscious grass to contemplate. For the hungry and tired sheep to sit down in a place of beauty and recoup. 
You know, I remember um, cycling up a mountain a few years ago and it was a blisteringly hot day. And I cycled and I cycled and I cycled and I cycled. And the further up the mountain you got, the more the sun beat down. And then in the end, I just got off the bike, lay down on the grass and just gulped my water drink. It was bliss. Bliss. On Monday this week, Rebecca and I walked up the Skirid and it was a gloriously hot day with blue skies on top and I had Seth on my back and I walked up and I walked back down and then I sat down at the end and had a nice little coffee from my thermos flask and it was bliss. The Lord is our shepherd and he makes us lie down. He makes us rest and he restores our soul. And please note, it says he makes us. He makes us. As Christians, we have a choice, really. We can rest and rest in Christ. Or we can not rest and be made to rest and be made to rest. The body will not always go on. The soul will not always go on. In the end, we will need to rest. And the Good Shepherd knows when we have to rest. I can remember many years ago, um, about 15, 16 years ago, it had been a very busy season in work, working too many hours, as I'm sure many of you work um, too many hours. And at the end of a very busy season, instead of taking a holiday, I decided to do a kind of preaching tour for 20 days. So I was going to be preaching um, for 20 days flat. And I think that preaching tour would have just knocked me sideways. I think it would have been the straw that broke the camel's back. And next thing I got a phone call to say that it was cancelled, all gone. And I was devastated. But you know what? I think that God made me rest. And the interesting part of that story, you may have heard me say it before, is that actually that's when I got together with Rebecca. So it was an enforced rest with a huge blessing. God knows what is best and sometimes he makes us rest and when we rest we are refreshed we're by these deep waters these still waters and the waters are there to refresh us and this happens even in the darkest times in the darkest times we need to be refilled because of our spiritual thirst. I think this often is what happens in the dark night of the soul. In those difficult times, often we get parched. That is, there is a desperate God, a thirst for him. Elsewhere, the Psalms put it like this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. We can become desperate for a touch from the Lord. Perhaps you know that at the moment, you are desperate for a touch from the Lord. Well, the amazing thing is, he refreshes your soul. There can be a supernatural touch from the Lord when by his spirit, he comes to you. He will minister to you. He will build you up. Do you need strengthening? Do you need refreshing? God can give it to you. He promises to give it to you here. Ultimately, he will restore your soul. And it's interesting how this happens. Philippians explains it like this. In Philippians chapter 4, in the kind of Jonathan Thomas version, it says this. When anxious, pray and you'll get peace. When anxious, pray and you'll get peace. That is, when you're struggling, turn to God, pray. And when you do that, he can minister to you. Now, I said earlier on, I'm not talking about a quick injection in the arm that makes you feel fine straight away. That can happen, but that doesn't always happen. Rather, this is more like a course of treatment, of physiotherapy, that actually helps us over time, that strengthens us. You see, with my fingers at the moment, as you can uh, see them, they're a bit of a mess. It'd be lovely if there was just a way to kind of click them back into place, uh, but there's not. It's repeated and constant work to make it better, to refresh them, to re-strengthen them. And it's exactly the same with our faith. And what we need is to have time to sit down in those green pastures, to drink of the waters. And I think you need to understand here, it's not just about sitting back and letting God 
but actually it's about him resting you and coming to his green pastures and coming to his deep waters. I guess this is kind of what we call the quiet time, time alone with the Lord. Maybe a better way to think of the quiet time is to think of it as water time, pasture time, grace time, refreshing time. Those times when he will restore your soul. That can be in a lovely chair in your home or with the headphones on on a commute or in a walk up a mountain or beside the river. Whichever way you do it, the key thing is, is to have time with God where he can refresh you. So the Lord is with you. God is with me. But here's the second thing. God is always with me. God is always with me. We see that in verses three and four. You see, very often in times of struggle, particularly in the dark night of the soul, we don't know what to do when we don't know what the right thing to do is. Often when I'm struggling, my brain gets fuzzy. Um, I get an attack of anxiety and kind of all my normal functions seem to grind to a halt. Even the simplest thing can be the most difficult. And so the dark night of the soul can be a very dangerous place because in those moments I can do silly things and so when we're in those dangerous places the good news of Psalm 23 is that the Lord will lead us he will lead us that's what he does he leads us along right paths paths of righteousness for his name's sake you see this working out in Luke 15 do you remember the Lord Jesus says this Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loves one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He literally walks him home on his shoulders along righteous paths. I love that idea of the good shepherd. He doesn't just give you a map. There's the righteous path. There's the right way. Off you go. Picks you up, puts you on his shoulders and walks you on his way. I think some of us have a tendency to think that all God is, and all Jesus is, is a motivator. Mr. Do you remember Mr. Motivator on GMTV? I think that's what we think. He just comes, he says, come on, you can do it, and then we do it, and woohoo, I did it. If that's how you think, you don't understand the gospel. I ain't doing it. I ain't walking those paths. I am on Jesus' shoulders. And he is carrying me. He is not a Mr. Motivator. He is the ultimate saviour. He is the good shepherd. He is with me. Always. Don't ask God to strengthen you and leave you. Ask God to take you. He will take you along paths of righteousness. But the problem is, we don't want to be taken. How often have you seen um, a sheep in a field and gets stuck in a hedge or a fence or, you know, rolled upside down? These things the sheep do. And then someone tries to help. And what do they do? They kick out. They kick out. And as soon as they can, they run off. That's exactly us. Jesus comes to help us, to save us. And we just kick out. I can do it. I can do it. Or as soon as he saves us, we run off in another direction and get knocked down by a car. We need to learn that Jesus leads us and we need to follow him. We need to be obedient. He will lead us in paths of righteousness. We need to be obedient to the Lord. Now, some of us have an issue with obedience. Can I tell you a secret? I have an issue with obedience as well. I want to be the captain of my own soul, do my own thing. Struggle with obedience. But this is what I need to learn. Who is asking me to be obedient? Who wants me to walk in paths of righteousness, the right paths? Look up. The Lord who is my shepherd, who restores my soul. The good shepherd, the New Testament, who says he laid down his life for me. Our obedience is obedience to the one who loves us. And this obedience, as we walk in with him, as he carries us upon his back along these righteous paths, God is always with me, even in death. Even in the darkest valley, God is with us. That valley of death. I'm sure many of us prefer the old version of this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow 
book there. And I'm sure you've heard it pointed out multiple times. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not into the valley of the shadow of death. That valley is not the end. And in that valley, it is but the shadow of death. Because that is all that's left for the believer. For the believer, you do not walk into a valley of death. No. You walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Death is more difficult for those left behind than those who have died. It is, isn't it? Those of you who have lost loved ones know how hard death is because it's loss and separation. But for the one who has died, they have gone through the valley of the shadow of death. They have crossed the Jordan. They are with the Lord. Jesus has woken them up and they are now in heaven. They are now in heaven. It's wonderful. And the Lord Jesus is our good shepherd who walks us in paths of righteousness even through death. Can we be sure of this? Can we know this? How can how can David proclaim Psalm 23 and particularly verse 4? How can he be so sure that we go through the valley of the shadow of death and it is but a shadow and one that we go through? How can he know? Well, context. We always say, read the context when you're reading the Bible. And the Psalms are in order. So what comes before Psalm 23? Psalm 22. And what is Psalm 22 about? It's all about the cross. Look back. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whose words are they? They're the Lord Jesus on the cross. We can only say Psalm 23 because Psalm 22 has been said by Jesus. It is because Jesus has been forsaken in our place that we can now say that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He restores my soul. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? How? Because of Jesus. He has done it all. You see, on the cross, Jesus went through the ultimate dark night of the soul. A dark night of the soul that none of us has come close to where the weight and sin of all believers was laid on him, when he who knew no sin became sin, where the Father who delighted in him turned his faith away and put his wrath upon him. An experience of darkness that actually made the physical world dark. As I read this week in a book, it was if all of the fury of a volcano was put in a coffee mug. All of the wrath against the sin of the world put in one man, in one place. Because of Psalm 22, Jesus in our place, we can sing and say and solidly hold on to Psalm 23. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's because he has died that we can live. And what an amazing life. Look forward to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 17. For the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear away from their eyes. Brothers, sisters, get this. Psalm 23 is true now, and it will really, really be true in heaven. Psalm 23 is true now, but it will be really, really true in heaven. The lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. What a saviour. You see, God became a shepherd who became a lamb, a sacrificial lamb, and now he's preparing a place for us where there will be no more dark nights of the soul. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, the believer can see eternal life. Can you see why God is our SOS? Can you see how Psalm 23 is our, our, our SOS? It reorientates us into the character of God and who we are therefore in him. Can we not sing with David, I will sing to the Lord 
for he has been good to me. So how does he lead us? How do we keep with him? Well, there's the means of grace. We see that uh, towards the end of verse 4. How does he restore my soul? How does he comfort me? Well, it is his staff and rod. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's why I will fear no evil. The staff is there um, traditionally to guide, to retrieve and to discipline. Um, and the rod is to defend from attack. And I think these represent the means of grace today. I think sometimes people see Bible reading and prayer um, as a burden that the Christian must do. Bonkers, bonkers. Bible reading and prayer is the blessing the Christian gets to do. They are the rod and the staff. It's by enjoying time with God he will lead us. The staff is his word, the Bible, where we hear God's word 100%. And the rod, the protection, is the cross where Jesus has died for us. That is how we know him. So what should we do? If we want to be restored, if we want to be refreshed, if we want to be able to walk through the valley, the shadow of death, and fear no evil, how do we do it? We pray with the Bible, looking to the cross. We pray with the Bible, looking to the cross. Fill your hearts and minds with the, with the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. Take that course of antibiotics. Have that daily physiotherapy. Make sure you are exercising the means of grace so that you are seeing Jesus more and more and more and more and more. That you're getting refreshed more and more and more and more. That you're looking forward to heaven when all your tears will be wiped away and there will be an eternal refreshment more and more and more and more. Drink in this truth. Drink in the word. The Lord is with us all the time. And let me finish quickly. Point three, God is always with me in goodness. God is always with me in goodness. You see it there in verses five and six, where we have this change of image to the image of a victory meal. And what a strange victory meal it is. Look at verse five. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Imagine a battlefield. And then the big table comes out. Actually, I think uh, kind of hundreds of years ago, when the British army would go to battle, I think that would literally happen sometimes. You kind of have all of these kind of battles going on. And then the kind of big high up in the army guys would have had someone carrying a table and crockery and food. And they'd have everybody kind of serving them. It's absolutely insane. But that is what this is. It's a completely opulent picture. Even though there are enemies, God prepares a table for me. God is always with me in goodness. What is the idea? We have complete victory. To sit down at a table to eat when you're surrounded by your enemies, you can only do that if you've got complete victory. And we have it. We have complete victory. We've sung about it already. What did we sing earlier on? Tis finished, the Messiah dies. Cut off for sin, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice. The great redeeming work is done. It is finished. All the debt is paid. Justice divine is satisfied. The ground, uh, the grand and full atonement made. God for a guilty world hath died. Jesus has done it all. Even when the world is a mess, we can rest. Even when there's a storm, we can be calm. Sometimes our greatest experience of grace is in the midst of suffering. Many of you know that in your most difficult times, God has come the closest. I believe the key to Christian living is to focus on the finished work of Christ. To look at his victory. To apply that to our hearts by the means of grace and what will he do he will restore our souls he goes on he says look you will anoint my head with oil my cup overflows my cup overflows as a staff team in church we're reading through a, a book on jesus and the cross and this week we were reading a chapter on Gethsemane and the cup. Remember the Lord Jesus, take this cup away from me. For Jesus, the cup was a cup of wrath. It was, as I said earlier on, 
all of the volcanoes of God's wrath put into a cup. No wonder he sweat drops of blood. But the wonderful thing for us as Christians is even though we deserve a cup of wrath, because Jesus took that cup and drank it, all the dregs to the very end so there was nothing left in the cup, he doesn't give us an empty cup. Oh, no, 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 no. He gives us an overflowing cup of blessing. Think about that divine exchange. I deserve a cup of wrath that would take all eternity in hell to drink. Jesus drinks it all and gives me a cup of blessing that overflows, that will take all eternity in heaven to enjoy. That is ours. Our cup overflows. So, how long is this true? How long will this last for? Well, if the cup overflows and keeps overflowing forever. Look at verse 6. Surely, here's the conclusion of the matter, surely Goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And notice what I missed out. Surely your goodness, not just goodness, but your goodness. It is him, my shepherd. He is who I want. The shepherd's goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Brothers, sisters, are you struggling? Are you in the dark night of the soul? I want to tell you this. Jesus has gone through the ultimate dark night of the soul, Psalm 22, the cross. And because of that, you can sing and say and just hold on to Psalm 23, that the Lord Jesus is the good shepherd and he will restore your soul even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he will prepare a table for you even in the midst of your enemies and all of the struggles. And he will anoint your head with oil and your cup does overflow. And that will happen now and it will happen in heaven. Fill your hearts and minds with the goodness of God, with the blessings of Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for you. And that, that will help you in the darkness and bring light, bring love. It's lavish. Enjoy it. Bless his holy name for all he's done for us. Well, we're going to close by singing a wonderful old hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Let's sing that together.
Father God, we thank you that because the Lord Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep and we are now your property, we thank you that you will never let us go, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, for those of us who are struggling, would you come and refresh our souls? For those of us who are just running headlong into busyness, would you stop us and refresh our souls? Oh, Father, be glorified as we are satisfied in you, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Amen.